Donc, euh, aujourd'hui, ah. <rire> euh, aujourd on a le plaisir de recevoir donc, Stéphanie Lassonnière, donc, qui est donc c'est le mois où on reçoit des euh, chères prairies et qui est professeur donc à euh, l'université de Paris euh, de médecine et euh, va nous parler donc, le titre, hein, donc c'est data augmentation in high dimensional low sample size setting using a geometry based variational auto encoding merci beaucoup uh, i guess i should switch to english i think so yeah. Okay, so let's share my screen here. Can you see the screen? Oops. Yes. Okay, great. All right, so uh, let's go for here. All right, so I'm, I will present today uh, some results that uh, have been uh, obtained by uh, my Prairie PhD student, Clément Chadebec. Uh, on variational autoencoders using geometrical uh, information in the latent space. And it's also a collaboration with Ninon Burgos and her PhD student, Elina thibault uh, for the medical data augmentation and the classification of Alzheimer's disease. So this is the overview of the talk. I first introduced why do we need uh, some data augmentation, then a short uh, Uh, introduction of uh, variational autoencoders, the mathematical framework, and where uh, we have added uh, geometry uh, into the framework so that we uh, have been able to use these uh, variational autoencoders to perform data augmentation and, up and uh, increase the statistical power of classifiers. So what is the main challenge? The main challenge is uh, to try to work with small number of subjects in the medical domain, we usually have about 50 uh, images, we will only talk about images today, which are fully representative of a population. So most of the time, if you use statistical method, you basically do some overfitting. And not only having small samples, we also have to face the large dimension of each input about thousands of dimensions if you consider an MRI of, of brains or other organs. So you need either to reduce the dimension of your inputs or to perform data augmentation. But this is not uh, one or the other. You can do both at the same time. One solution uh, is given by generative models. You can either use statistical hierarchical model that we all know, so you draw equations so that you mimic the generation of data and you estimate the parameter of these statistical models, or you can use neural network based models. But the issue is that most of the time, these methods are unable to really generate relevant data that are visually relevant and also increasing static, statistical analysis powers in the small sample size setting. So when you think about data augmentation, the usual, uh, the classical ways are to perform some transformation on the image. So you have one original image and you either zoom, contrast, change or rotate it. You can add noise or blur so that you, tr you, tr you add from one image four or five other ones with the same label into your data set. This is interesting. However, this is really data dependent. If you think about these uh, uh, digits, rotating this nine end up with a six so that you have to say at some point that rotation is relevant until a certain degree. So basically you have to include an expert knowledge, which is easy for this example. But if you think about the type of um, deformation you were allowed to use staying in the same category, let's say control persons, so that you will pre preserve the class, the, 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 class, the cluster uh, level, but produce new images that are still relevant. This is some knowledge that we do not have. So the attractive solution is to go back to generative models. And the ones that we will talk about are uh, are based on neural network, 
briefly, GANs have been performed interesting thing, but we will focus today on virus in auto encoders. So as I said, GANs were used in many different uh, modalities of images. However, in all these studies, you have either a very large training set, more than a thousand, or you have small dimensions. So you have uh, some, some extraction of features that have been pre-processed pre before. So nothing has been done until now, or at least uh, up to our knowledge, for the high dimensional low sample size setting. And so we tried to use virus and to uh, perform data augmentation in that specific setting. Can I, can I ask a question? Sure. So GANs have been used for, for, for um, that augmentation in, in these papers, or they've been used for, for something else? Um, so it has been used for data augmentation, in particular to increase the power of some classifiers. Because for that augmentation, I understand, but otherwise they hallucinate stuff, right? So how can you use them in medicine when they hallucinate uh, data? No, no, it, it's augmentation basically... Is fine. Sorry? For data augmentation, it's fine, but... It's... Yeah, yeah, it's, it, those, those papers are, are for data augmentation. Ah, okay, 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 thanks. So uh, back to the auto encoders, uh, the objective of data auto encoder is really dimensionality rejection. So you have your input, you encode it in a lower dimensional latent space so that the decoding point shows an image that looks like the input. If you look at the mathematical framework, you assume that each data belongs to a set of high dimension and there exists uh, latent variable z, in, which lives in a much lower dimensional space, which will represent x. And if you write the objective function, you actually want your inputs to be close to the decoded and coded inputs. So you have something that is uh, here in the L2 norm for images, but you can think about other norms. So if you have this objective function to optimize, you can optimize it use, uh, by, by stochastic gradient descent with parameters of the encoder and decoder that are given by neural net. The question is, given this, can you generate new data with this framework? You would like to sample from this latent space, decode these samples to generate new examples. However, the latent space is really poorly informed. Each point in the, in, in the data set is coded by only a single point, and you have nothing, no idea about what's happening around, and there is no structure or distribution that appear in this latent space. This is why there is another framework that emerged, which is the variational autoencoder. So it's really based on the same principle. However, you not only encode your input by a single point, but rather with a distribution in the latent space. The mathematical framework is the following now. You still have your input in some high dimensional space, but you assume that they follow a parametric distribution, p theta, which depends on the latent variable z with a certain prior, which usually is just a center normal distribution so that you can write the likelihood as follows, this integral. Some examples for images are the prior being the uh, center normal distribution. And for example, for images, you have a product of uh, Bernoulli distributions. The objective is to maximize this likelihood with respect to theta, which are the parameters of the model. However, usually this, uh, th this uh, integral is not even tractable and neither uh, with close form, mathematical close form, nor numerically. So you have to either go to uh, uh, um, variational inference, well, you have to go to variational inference where I just draw the equations here using the Jensen inequality so that you find a lower bound of your objective function that you will optimize, knowing that the equality of the Jensen inequality appears for the conditional distribution of the latent variable given the observation. So you have two ways of optimizing this quantity. 
either you go to the expectation maximization like algorithms. So it's a, a large spectrum of algorithm that has been developed uh, since uh, the previous century. Or you can move to uh, another solution, which is approximate the posterior distribution by some parametric form. So here is my target distribution, which, we, which is the distribution that will manage to reach the optimal in my lower bound. And I do approximate it with some parametric function. The parametric function is, for example, this Gaussian distribution, meaning that for each input, I have a latent variable that will depend, that, that, which is normally distributed with a mean and a standard deviation that depends on the uh, input image x. Introducing this, uh, you have an unbiased estimate of your log likelihood, and you can write now your lower bound, known as the evidence lower bound, as follows. So this is this expectation with respect to this distribution, to this approximated distribution of the complete log likelihood and the log of this uh, approximated distribution. So now you can see the elbow as a function of two parameters, the model parameter and the distribution, the, the approximate distribution phi, uh, parameter, which are theta and phi. And you can optimize, of course, with respect to theta and phi jointly. And for that, you can use stochastic gradient descent. But you can think about the elbow as a lower bound itself and say, well, I will optimize with respect to phi, or maybe I could go for a little bit further and try to optimize directly with respect to the sampling so that at the end of the day, I will not only draw samples from my normal distribution uh, previously introduced, but something that is modified so that I will closely um, converge towards the true posterior distribution. So reach the, reaching the equality in my dense and inequality. So we're gonna talk about the two objectives. What about the first one? The first one, well, if you look at this distribution, the model is not tracked, well, it's not uh, differentiable because the uh, random variable depends on this normal distribution, which depends on the parameters with, with, a run, with randomness. So you have to use what is called the par reparameterization uh, trick so that there is some randomness, but your sample is a differentiable function of the parameters, which are mu x and sigma x. So keep in mind that we always want differentiable functions of the parameters so that we can do the back propagation in the stochastic gradient descent. So if you do this, well, the optimization of the elbow is possible and you have reached objective one. Reaching objective one enables you to uh, optimize the elbow as a function. So now you have a function. Can you do some uh, generation of new samples? So if you go back to the model, the model is the following. You have your prior on the latent space. Given that prior, you have some distribution that is given by the decoder. So the generating, generating scheme is easy. You sample from the prior distribution that is given here, and then you decode elements so that you should end up with something that is relevant. This is very simple. So in practice, this works in a, just a second. However, the priors, that is the standard normal distribution and the posterior that comes out are not really expressive enough to capture the, the high complexity of the distribution underlying the light and space. And with a standard normal distribution, you will see in examples that you have a very poor prospecting of the latent space. So let's keep this in mind and then try to move to objective two and see the elbow as a bound itself. So you can rewrite the equation. So the elbow is actually equal to our objective function minus the kullback liber divergence between the target distribution, the one that really um, enables you to reach the optimal and its approximation. So since this element is always positive, the way, it, the, the way you think about uh, objective two is how can you reduce this quantity? 
there are several attempts that I've been doing to produce random variables that will slowly target the posterior distribution using, as we did before, some initialization of a sequence given by a simple distribution like the standard normal distribution. But you have to ensure that it is possible in practice and that you can still do the backpropagation. So remember that trick that we need to have. So the first solution that have, has been introduced uh, is called normalizing flows. It's exactly the same principle as we did for the reparationization trick, which means you have to write your sample as a differentiable function of your, of your parameter, including some randomness, uh, uh, which was the standard normal distribution sample. So here, Instead of, instead of just a simple uh, affine transformation, you think of composing several here k functions that are differentiable so that you have at the end of the day, the distribution of your sample zk given x, which is known. Here you can, for example, use the standard normal distribution and then the parameters you have to optimize, the phi uh, parameters, are given by the determinant of the Jacobian of these k functions. If you do that, then you can perform objective two. You will slowly uh, uh, reach the optimum, meaning that you will both decrease the value of the Kullback Lieber divergence while optimizing the parameter of the encoder and decoders. This is interesting. However, usually to be efficient, these functions are parameterized by, uh, well, our neural network, parametric neural networks themselves. So it's a very high dimension. And it also impl imposed to be able to compute the determinant of the Jacobian as its maps, which is somehow really um, heavily computationally speaking. So the second idea was introduced uh, several years ago and was uh, introduced by thinking of why can't we do some marker uh, steps for this uh, for, for sequence in the latent space so that at the end of the day, the Markov chain will have the good, the, the, the objective function as uh, our, uh, our target distribution. So this is the Hamiltonian variational autoencoder, which has been introduced in those paper. I will give the reference at the end. So just a quick reminder about Hamiltonian framework. You have a target density, p, p, pi x, which is for us the one that will cancel the Kullback Lieber divergence, so the true posterior distribution. So our random variable is z, and you introduce an auxiliary random variable called the momentum, rho, which is given by a, a normal distribution that is centered with a third certain matrix m, which is usually uh, very simple, so most of the time I'd, uh, something proportional to identity. If you write what is called the Hamiltonian, it's basically a potential function and a kinetic function so that it's an energy and it, it mimics a dynamic so that if you sample rho and z with respect to that dynamic, at the end of the day, you will create for z a Markov chain that is ergodic, time reversible, and which has exactly our target distribution a stationary distribution. And interestingly, there is a discrete scheme which is explicit, deterministic, and differentiable up to this last step, which enables you to do it in practice. So basically, you're able to, to solve the, the, the Hamiltonian dynamic. So basically, to keep the differentiability, you have to remove this metropolis asking step, which is acceptation uh, rejection method. So keeping only the discrete scheme, you are able from a Z0 and a row zero to produce some sample Z, K, up to K step that will have this, this distribution as the stationary distribution. 
So if you look at what is now this Hamiltonian variational token model, you have your input that is encoded with respect to mu x and sigma x so that you start from z0 with this so that you still keep the backpropagation. Using z0, you perform several steps of your Hamiltonian Monte Carlo sampler and decode this element so that you expect to recover something close to the input. The issue is that, unfortunately, it does not perform very well on small data sets, uh, so that we had to introduce a new framework. And if you think about uh, this Hamiltonian dynamic, you can think of it uh, as a particle living in a space and trying to explore the space with high probability, well, um, high energy or lower energy. And this space is usually not flat and should have some structure. So this is why we have introduced a notion of geometry. The assumption from, of variational autoencoder was that the light in space was Euclidean. Euclidean means flat with the standard uh, norm, with the standard uh, scalar product. We re relaxed this assumption and introduced the, late, the uh, Riemannian structure, a Riemannian manifold structure, with a certain metric G for this latent space. And we will try to exploit this geometrical aspect so that we can create a probability distribution on the latent space, which will inform us about the place where it's interesting to sample and places where it's not. So the idea of this uh, work was to really exploit the manifold structure of the latent space to first improve the posterior sampling so that we will reach faster and better the optimal of the objective two. We will learn the metric because we don't have any idea of what should be a good metric in this latent space. And this metric will inform us about a, posterior, a probability distribution in latent space, allowing us to do some uh, data augmentation by just sampling with respect to this uh, probability distribution on the latent space. So just back to several elements for you to understand what's coming later on, geomet on Riemannian geometry. So in our setting, the manifold we will, uh, we will consider are always RD, but endowed with a special metric uh, G, which basically says that the space RD is no more flat, but somehow has curved mountains and valleys. So that if you want to go from one point to the other, the straight line is no more the optimal line. You have to go around the mountain and the valley so that you, you have to follow the, low, the, the shortest path with respect to that curve space. So in this uh, Riemannian manifold setting, you can define geodesic curves, which are given by path of minimal length that you can define here with respect to some scalar product on the tangent space. And these geodesic paths are not only minimizing the length of the curve, but also its energy, so which means it's easier to compute. How do you use this to uh, improve the posterior sampling? Well, it has been introduced in uh, 1911 by uh, Girolami and Calderhead, the, uh, Calderhead, the, um, the idea of Riemannian Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. If you remember what was the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, you have your random variable that was Z, and you add, you create a new momentum that has some specific distribution. In, in um, this paper, Girolami Calderhead, they propose to have a position specific momentum distribution here. So not now my random variable rho has a distribution that depends on the, the metric at point at the current point of the particle Z. And if you simulate the evolution of this particle, you do simulate it on the manifold. The dynamic now is not on the flat space, but respects the curvature, the local curvature everywhere. You can write the Hamiltonian 
same as before. There is another term that is introduced, which is, of course, the inclu includes the determinant of G, which comes from this term, the normalization constant. And there exists general leapfrog integrator to be able to sample from the Hamiltonian dynamics so that at the end of the day, the variable Z has um, a distribution which is exactly our target distribution. So exactly the same framework. However, you introduce some geometry informed uh, uh, metric to move around the space. So what are the pros and cons? Well, um, in the Gérolami and Cadarat's paper, it, it was shown that it was really efficient to capture uh, the underlying geometry of the data. So it really improves the sampling method. It really improves the sampling. However, uh, the metric is unknown. And if you use the um, Fisher information metric, it might not be that efficient in, in particular because it involves a lot of calculation. So we have proposed to introduce a parametric metric that actually will be estimated at the same time as the encoder and decoder parameters. The form of the metric is the following. So basically at point Z, the inverse metric is given by some, uh, uh, some information given at some centroids, which are the uh, encoding point, and which decrease with a certain scale. And the anisotropy around this point is given by some triangular, uh, lower triangular matrices that are parameters using neural network as well. And you have here something to regularize, but we have shown that does not, not make a lot of difference. So basically, each point will, will be encoded by a centroid and the information around the centroid will be spread with a certain anisotropy uh, in, in the direction in the latent space. Why is this uh, form of the inverse metric interesting? Because uh, we have cross-form expression for uh, the inverse metric, which is used for the geodesic computation. So we will have access to the uh, geodesic formulation easily. And what is interesting as well is that if you look at the geodesics themselves, they will try travel through most populated areas. So what is the scheme of uh, the framework we have now? We still have the same beginning, okay? But when you will do your Hamiltonian, Riemannian Hamiltonian variational autoencoder here, several steps of the generalized leapfrog, you will be informed by some metric, which is estimated also given the data. And so at the end, you have another here parameter, set of parameters that are psi, the parameters of the uh, triangle, lower triangular matrices that are also estimated so that you informed the um, Markov chain about the ge local geometry around the point it's moving. Right, so some examples, question. What is the question? What is the inverse metric? Ah, well, the inverse metric. So when you, when you compute geodesic, uh, when, you, when you have a metric on a space, uh, you, are, you do give G of Z at each point, okay? Which could be, for example, for a sphere, just a constant because the sphere has a constant uh, curvature, okay? So this, the, the curvature of the sphere is constant. So the local geometry uh, on the sphere is equivalent everywhere. If you, if you parameterize the metric itself, uh, sometimes you have troubles because the geodesics are not easily computable. Computable, yeah. Um, so here we, for, for two reasons, uh, the first one was to have easy uh, computation of geodesics. We try to uh, have something that is computationally efficient so that we parameterize the inverse. So we are not computing G, but G minus one, so inverse. 
And, uh, and the other reason is that G inverse also appears here. So using G inverse makes it a little bit easier. I'm not sure I did answer your question. Who speaks? Erwan? Uh, yeah, I think. Thank you. Okay, good. Right. Okay, so some examples. Uh, actually, uh, Clément, uh, my PhD student, uh, uh, tried on a very simple, uh, purely synthetic data set, um, which, are, which is composed of uh, disks of different size and rings of, again, different size. So this is just a, a, a sample of the training sample. And here is the less than space that has been estimated by the method we have presented, where the circles are given by the crosses and the rings, the encoded rings and the encoded circles are given in here. So each, each dot is a data, and uh, is an input, each cross is an input, but the latent space that you were, uh, the, the color, the gray level colors are actually the metric that is uh, the inverse metric that is here. Okay, so darker is, uh, it, it are the points that are closer to the data, back to here. So here, darker, are the elements of higher G minus one, so lower metric, okay? So uh, this is the encoded set, so the latent space. And you see that uh, there is a structure that is naturally coming out so that there is no clue of doing some interpolation between two points with a straight line. Naturally, there exists some structure uh, in the latent space that appears. And if you do the interpolation between two points, which are here, two circles of different size, by just doing the linear interpolation, so I'm going straight, whatever hills I have to climb, this is what happens when you decode along this path. You start by something that is re reasonable and suddenly you do some, um, decoding of something that is not relevant because it does not appear in the training set, you go through the other class, which are the rings, and move back to the small circle. If you do the geodesic interpolation, so now you really try to compute what is the shortest path inside these uh, mountains uh, from one point to the other, you go all along this blue curve, which decoded gives you exactly what you expect, which is a contraction of these uh, of this circle. So another example, which is not completely synthetic, but kind of a toy example, are uh, is given by the shoes of fashion and nest. Here is the latent space that has been encoded, and uh, here is the affine and geodesic interpolations. And again, you see that the affine interpolations produces shoes that do not look as shoes, okay? However, if you go from geodesic, from, from one point to the other, uh, flat shoe and heel shoes, you slowly move to some shoes that are still shoes with relevant shapes. And then at the end of the day, you do some interpolation which look re looks relevant. And now the third point was, uh, can we use this metric to produce a probability distribution on the space so that we will be able to sample from this probability distribution in the latent space and then produce relevant samples. If you look at this map, you have a grayscale map. I said darker is a lower metric. Well, it's a high, it, it could be um, interpreted as a high probability and actually, uh, Penek has proposed to use exactly this geometry to produce a probability distribution on a, um, a manifold so that from the metric you derive a probability distribution which is actually the uniform distribution on the Riemannian manifold. So basically if you have some compact set which basically is a square here 
then using the determinant of the inverse of the metric provides you with some PDF uh, on, on the latent space. And of course, you can sample from this distribution using MCMC sampler and, for example, the Riemannian Hamilton in Monte Carlo, as we perform, as we did for the training. The metric is a norm. No, it's not a norm, but it tells you it tells you um, if you have uh, hills, if you are in a corridor, if you are close to a flat space. The metric at the point, um, imagine you are uh, imagine you are on mountains. The metric will tell you that if you want to go from one point to the, to the other, you'd rather go first in a specific direction. Um, to, yeah. What I meant is that to me, metric is uh, related to a distance. A distance yeah, yeah, earth. exactly. So a metric at one point, what does it mean? The, the metric. Is I, I think the, the I think the question is uh, the metric the metric is a is a matrix, basically at each point, and so what we what we show with the darker uh, thing in the Latin space is the, the the volume element of the metric, so it's the log, ah. log of the metric. So you the want to know what, how you what is the mathematical element? So the metric, the metric, yeah, it's a metric. Uh, Clément said exactly the truth. So. At each point, it's a matrix, which uh, it's it's kind of, it's kind of a covariance matrix. Ah, okay. Okay, it's really a cover. Well, it's really look like a covariance matrix, which tells you in which direction the metric should be uh, enlarged and in which direction just should be the metric sh should be shortened. Okay. okay. Thank you, Clément, and uh, Christian. It's like a general Geoffrey. You should send me the. No, I mean it's, it's a determinant. It's a square root of the determinant of a determinant of a matrix, and so the Geoffrey's prior yeah. is is um, is exactly of that shape. Okay. I'll so it's it. generalization of Geoffrey's in, in in the sense that G is not necessarily the information matrix or the inverse oh. information matrix. Okay. Thanks. All right, uh, so thanks to the parametric form of G minus one, this probability distribution is easy to compute. And we do sample in the, in the darker area, which are close to the, in a, to the input points. So here are several sampling comparison. Uh, using the vanilla uh, variation of the encoder, you have here the latent space using some uh, multimodal conditional prior inside the VA here is another uh, latent space, and this is our latent space. What you have to notice is that although we do not say anything to the vanilla VIA, there is still a structure that shows up in the latent space, again, although we didn't say anything about the data, okay? However, this Riemannian structure of the inputs appeared naturally. So this was not a stupid idea to start uh, from that idea because I, we, well, we still have not understood uh, why the structure appeared, but it seems that naturally the variational autoencoders tries to put some structure in the latent space. So you have the input data in orange and green. And you have the samples, the synthetic samples that are produced here using the standard normal distribution with blue points and that are decoded in the back, in the bottom. Here, same for this VAMP prior here and for our methods. So what you see here is that what I said uh, actually earlier, you have a very poor information using this standard normal distribution. You only sample around zero and zero may not be very, if very relevant so that you sample from uh, elements that when reconstructed do not look like anything, okay? You have uh, here or there. And in this specific example, you barely have access to the other class that is the circle. So you only sample from one class. 
if you use a little bit more information in your latent space, so saying that you have a, a, a multimodal conditional prior in the latent space, it's a little bit better, but still you see that in the middle here, you sample from, from a space that is not very well described so that you again have elements that are not relevant, which do not appear here in this method since you sample from the distribution that is given by the darker, uh, darker uh, spaces, darker areas, sorry, in this latent space. And if you see here, you have both circles of different, uh, both circles and of different size, both rings of different size, and just one here that is not relevant. So we have compared uh, this we ha with higher dimensional uh, data sets. So you have MNIST, EMNIST, fashion MNIST. So again, training set and samples at the bottom. And we have performed this. Uh, we have used this to perform data augmentation. So I will introduce the framework showing you the performance uh, on toy examples so that uh, we have studied the robustness of the method and move to medical imaging. So the framework was the following. We had input data. We separate in three space, in three groups. So the train set, the validation set, and the test set. The train set was used to um, train the, the variational autoencoder, which produces the synthetic data. And this training set could be used also in addition to the synthetic data to perform the classifier, to optimize the classifier, for example, a CNN, and validate it on the validation set. And then performance were estimated on the train set. So basically the train set on the test set. So the train set could have could be used only once just for variational autoencoder training or twice for the training and also in addition to the synthetic data to um, optimize the classifier. So on toy data, what happens? We have tried to see the robustness across the data sets. So you have here yeah, MNIST and Ballast MNIST where you, we don't pay attention to the number of elements per class, unbalanced e MNIST and fashion MNIST. And here you have the baseline. Oops, sorry, so the first line is the baseline. And we have used classic methods for data augmentation up to 15, 15 uh, times the, number, the initial number of images and use different version of the variational autoencoder or our autoencoder with different numbers of uh, synthetic data. And what appear are is that, well, classic data augmentation is really dependent on the data set so that the performance uh, on, for example, on fashion MNIST is not very interesting. The vanilla variational autoencoders is close to the performance of uh, the classic data augmentation. And our methods with 1,000 or 2,000 uh, synthetic data were able to outperform uh, each, method, each other method. Uh, if you use only the synthetic data, to you for this, the classifier, we still have very interesting performances on all data sets. We have also tried to see the robustness with respect to classifier. Uh, of course, uh, the previous performance were, uh, were um, given with a, just a CNN uh, for the classifier. And uh, if you look at some different classifier, also going to Kinear's neighbor, Random Forest or SVM, the results are very similar. And last but not least, our goal was to reach the high dimension, low sample size setting, basically what is on the left-hand side of, our, of this graph. However, we do not want to uh, reduce the performance if we have access to a lot of data. And so we uh, try to estimate the performance, the accuracy, with respect to the number of samples per class going up to 1,000. And so, as, we, as you can see, if you are in low regime, then we do really uh, increase the accuracy, but we never reduce the accuracy uh, 
uh, with respect to just the baseline, although we have uh, this generation uh, of synthetic data in addition. Right. I hope I'm going to go fast for the medical images. So basically, uh, for the medical uh, application, we wanted to do some classification tasks between Alzheimer's disease patient versus cognitive normal patient. We did uh, uh, use two different databases, which uh, one uh, is the Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging initiative, which is an American database with uh, a lot of uh, person which have been scanned uh, several times, and but we only use the baseline. So basically the initial uh, MRI that has been done for this person. And uh, we also use ABLE, which is the equivalent of ADNI, but for Australian people, so that we were uh, trying to see if in increasing uh, the uh, performance on the American population would help also to increase performance on the Australian ones. There has been a lot of pre-processing of the data. So raw data have been pre-processed to have uh, good looking images of reasonable size. And so just a, a little guess, um, you have here two true uh, patients and two fakes. Uh, if you want to play, uh, you can try to say uh, which one is the which one are the intruders. So uh, if you want to play, I can just you give you two three seconds in the chat to tell me if you can see some difference. But I guess no one will risk <laughs> any conclusion, and you would be right because we have asked. Um, radiologist to tell us whether or not they can make a difference between the fake and the and the true patients, and then we're not able to uh, to um, find the true intruders, which are A and D. And basically, it was like a flipping a coin, flipping flipping a coin. So we were quite happy. At least visually, the patient we were generating really looked like patients. But we also quantified the performances. So basically using all the data of ADNI, so basically uh, a, a, around 200 Alzheimer's disease and uh, 250 controls, or we reduced the data set to 50-50 so that uh, we, were, uh, we were in the uh, low sample size setting. We had about uh, 50 to 60 person in the validation set and keep 200, one of each, 100 each uh, in the test set. And the test has also been performed on the ABLE data set. Independently from the training, ABLE has been used only for testing. We have also uh, used two different classifiers. One was given by previous studies which is supposed to be optimal for this task on this data set. And the other one was, uh, was optimized by uh, Elina on a, with a random search uh, for this uh, clinical uh, training set. And the results are so uh, four different kind of results on the reduced training set or the full training set, either for the baseline algo classifier or the optimized classifier. So I'm not going to go into the details, but basically you will always see in bold that the, uh, the, the, our method using real and synthetic images together always outperform the classification rate for the ADMI, for the ABLE data sets, and either with the baseline, so the one from the literature or the optimized uh, classifier. So, I hope I'm on time. Uh, so um, we have proposed some new geometry aware variation autoencoder encoder that enables to do some data augmentation. And it has been validated on different examples to see its robustness, to see its efficiency in the high dimensional low sample size setting, uh, setting in particular. The strengths are that uh, it's really independent from the nature of the data set. We went from 2D very small images to 3D medical ones. Uh, it produces relevant synthetic images, not only for a classification purpose, but also visually. So we're not producing uh, brains that have specific uh, characteristics that are not relevant. And we also uh, have produced images that whatever 
classifier you use are still relevant for the classification test. So they do not depend on the classifier. The limitations, uh, well, uh, although Clément has done a very hard work, it did not try to optimize the variational autoencoder architecture itself so that all the results you have here may be um, increased uh, with optimizing the architecture, but with the same architecture for all the variational autoencoders that has been have been tested, the performance are always better using the uh, Riemannian framework. But so if you if you optimize the architecture, you there, there is a high chance that you also increase the performances. Next step is to use the longitudinal data. Uh, longitudinal trajectories are very interesting for prediction of outcomes, uh, of prediction of, um, of efficiency of treatment, et cetera. So we are now moving to uh, the longitudinal data analysis. And the question still remains is, uh, is 50 uh, a large data set or not. Uh, for the moment, we are kind of lucky because we have access to that amount of data for each application we are facing. It might not be always the case. So basically, some uh, some compared well, reducing the training uh, training set to see if there is a drop some at some point would be interesting as well. And last but not least, uh, Clément Chadebec uh, has implemented it uh, on an open access Python library, which is called Pyrug. And he also did an extensive comparison of the data generation using variational autoencoders, as you can see here. So these are uh, the number of uh, variational autoencoders like uh, algorithm that uh, he implemented in the same way so that you can, you can make the comparison and you have everything that is available, if I can find it here, on his web page. So you have the Pyrog library and you have here the other one where you have all the methods that are uh, trained, well, re-implemented and trained for different class, for different uh, data set, MNIST basically and uh, Cerebra. All right, thank you. Thank you, can I, can I ask you? Oh, yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Stephanie, for this nice talk. And uh, let okay. uh, Jean ask uh, the first question. Yeah, and so thank you for the presentation. It was interesting, the results are very good. But the, um, more generally, I've never understood uh, data augmentation because to me it seems that you uh, you don't add any new information to what you had before. I know it works in practice, but I never understood that, and I understand it even less with generative methods because my impression is that if you could capture a good model of distribution of data, then you could do Bayesian classification. You could do all sorts of stuff that you cannot do. And my impression it was much harder to capture distribution of the data than to do classification. Is there anything that I remember from that thing's book? And so I've, I do, do not understand how, whether it's GANs, rational encoders, and whatever, why, why, why one should think that there is a chance to give you a good model of your data. It's nothing to do with the technique that you are using that's very interesting, but it's the general principle that I do not understand. So I was wondering if you could comment on that. So th this is exactly what you said. You try to estimate what is the, um, the distribution of the data. If, if you, you look can. at the data, the, the data are very high dimension, very uh, complex, and you, can, you don't know well. If you're looking to a hand, you know that if you, uh, if you cut a finger, then at some point it's not a, a hand, okay? So that's fine, it's not a hand, you know it. Uh, for different kind of data, this is much more difficult to capture what is the relevant distribution that is given by several pictures of, of, of the data. So what is exactly this method doing? It's capturing the distribution of the data. It's exactly what you say, capture, can we capture the distribution of the data just um, kind of blindly? We don't, we don't have any clue. I thought, I thought this was impossible. This, I thought that's what that Nick was saying, that it is much, <laughs> much, much harder to capture distribution of the data than to classify it. Yeah, it's much harder, but you can actually capture 
something that is not the distribution of the data, but it's close to the distribution of the data. You don't, you cannot say that uh, this is the distribution of the data. What you can say, it's basically, you have an approximation um, of the distribution of the variation, the possible variation of the data that are still relevant given the data set you have at, uh, uh, in, in hand. Okay. I still don't see it, but it's not your fault. Because <laughs> then you could do a lot of other things with it, right? Not just generate samples. Oh, yeah. <laughs> People don't, they just generate samples. We, we have used it to generate new samples to um, increase. Well, the question in, medi in medicine is usually you never have enough data. So basically, when you try to do something, you lack data. So our main major uh, interest was how can we help producing fake data that are still relevant visually and for classif well for classification or whatever uh, thing you want prediction for example of outcomes uh, if you want in medicine that was the purpose of this method sure sure okay there you. is another interesting thing but we have not been able to quantify everything but if you think of data of medical data that they cannot be uh, taken out from the hospital okay because of privacy, because of everything. If we are able to create fake data, synthetic data from one site, and prove that these do not uh, make it possible to go back to the initial data, we will have data sets that are, are of uh, whatever size you wish, that can go out from a hospital, that can be merged with other data from another hospital to have multicentric data set to do the good uh, clinical uh, clinical uh, analysis that you expect. But isn't there a danger then because you are extrapolating on fake data and uh, this is uh, we are still we yeah. do in vision we don't care because we work on fake problems but we work on real. Problems, so. <laughs> this is what we need to quantify. Thank you. Is there any other question? Yes, I have a, a question about the latent space. Um, so, I mean, first, I'm, yeah, I love this uh, uh, this remaining uh, return to to HMC. Uh, the, the second thing is that because uh, to me the latent space is, is an artificial construct, uh, how can you infer the the right dimension for this latent variable Z? Mm -hmm. Because That's a, you want to reduce the dimension as much as possible. Yeah, that is, uh, that, that is another question, which is more related to model selection, which we did not address. Uh, and Clément should be able to answer the question. What was the, uh, how did you specify the dimension for the medical images, but for the synthetic data and for MNIST or fashion MNIST, it was a very low dimension, two, two was uh, enough. For the medical images, I think it was 10 to, to, to 20. Clément, yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's it? Yeah. So basically we were trying different size and, and then, well, different di dimension and then choosing the one that was performing the, for the classification purpose was performing the best. But uh, this is a relevant question. I hope something, I hope that since we are considering a Riemannian structure, as you saw for the examples of the circles, they are in 2D, but they are living on a one dimensional line. Mm. Okay, so mm. what I expect from this Riemannian structure is that at some point you will capture the true dimension with the metric. Yeah. Again, it's not proved, but I, I do hope we are close to that. But again, to, uh, to read, to, to link with Jean's question, um, in a sense, uh, yeah, the, the metric or, or the should um, be connected with, with the classification so that uh, different groups would, would be far away and, and individual within one group would be close. That's what we do expect. We have, a, I didn't show that, but I can. We have tried also 
well, Clément has tried to do some clustering in the latent space, yeah. of course, using the metric, and somehow it works. So basically, on this uh, on this really simple synthetic data set, you do estimate the metric, and you do some uh, chemidoids or remedian chemidoids, and you and you end up with something that is much more relevant for clustering in the latent space using the metric. So it's not obviously uh, completely uh, uh, straight. So you don't have a straight line to separate circles from rings, but basically the separation was over here. There are still something that uh, are in between, but small circles, uh, small rings are very close to each other. So this area of the latent space is something that is really difficult to distinguish from circles to rings. But basically, if you do some clustering using the metric in the latent space, you end up with something that is uh, that is performing well. Hmm. Yeah. How do you label the synthetic data or ensure the synthetic data is not a mix of multiple classes? Ah, when you have one group, for example, AD, you estimate your latent space metric on the AD group, then you do another estimation, independent estimation on the control group, and then you sample AD and you sample control independently. And then you know that the label of the synthetic data from uh, left-hand side group is uh, AD and from the right-hand side is uh, control. This is how we do. And to be sure that there is no mixture inside the latent space, we, we do not have any, any idea of this, but we can to, try to do some, uh, well, uh, k-means in, uh, in, in this latent space in, with the, 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 the Riemannian metric to see if there are several different groups that we can uh, highlight in the latent space. Okay, thank you. Is there still time for other question? Oh, there is a question on the discussion. Uh, yeah, so did you try to similarly optimize VAE and classify it? No, no. VAE and uh, metric are optimized uh, first. And then from this, you generate new data. And these data are put into a classifier that is optimized uh, given uh, the augmented data set. Hope it's fine. Okay, there was another question uh, ah. about how do you label the synthetic data and ensure the synthetic data is not a mix of multiple classes? I, I, I think I, I think I think you answered it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So any other questions? Oh, so please go to see uh, Clément Chadebeck's homepage. Uh, you will see uh, many examples and uh, you can play with uh, the method uh, itself yourself. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, see you next month.